Thanks, Joe, and thanks, Brad. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for hopping on. Um, I know a lot of you probably don't know who I am. I know I haven't met most of you. I do recognize a lot of names um, from looking at a lot of our results from the junior tour. Um, as Joe mentioned, I serve as the executive director of the Southern California PGA, uh, but I want to give you a little history and background. Um, I'm myself an alumni of our junior tour, um, played junior golf growing up in the in the 80s. Um, so I'm a little bit older, but uh, golf has been really important to me. Uh, became a PGA professional. Um, I was fortunate enough to play college golf myself. Um, I played at Oklahoma State University, so go Pokes. Um, you know, at that time, it was it was um, so challenging, right? Um, the recruiting um, has changed dramatically. College golf has changed dramatically and all for the better. Um, it's, it's in a wonder, wonderful place. And I know when we get better and so we're thrilled to partner with Athlos, um, you know, as we look to expand the benefits that we provide our junior tour members, um, Athlos was a perfect fit. You know, obviously we provide top notch com um, competitions for our junior members, you know, with over 400 events, we're going to hit close to 4,000 juniors. We've seen a lot of great players come through this program. Um, but we really want to focus on what are some other benefits that we could provide to our members and and helping in the college recruitment process is certainly one of those. And so we're uh, we're thrilled to 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 partner with uh, with Joe and Brad and Athlos. I know they're going to be out at uh, at our event at Saboba next week. So if any of you are participating in that, I know they'll talk about it. Um, highly, highly encourage you to, to stop by and um, have a listen to what they have to say. Um, you know, learn something, ask questions. Uh, we're here to help you, you know, um, Kevin Smith and William and Ray, um, all, all the team. Um, they're not only here to help you um, with providing you great events to compete, uh, but we're here to help you in any way we can. So please don't hesitate to ever reach out. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to have all of you here tonight uh, from, from the SCPGA. So uh, like Joe mentioned, Athlos, uh, we're a service that helps uh, junior golfers and their families navigate uh, the ever-changing and ever more complex golf recruiting process. So guiding you from, you know, point A all the way through, point A to point Z all the way through that process, uh, which can be a confusing one. Uh, so my background, uh, I grew up, I've been around the game my whole life. I grew up uh, in Chicago suburbs, uh, attended Indiana University uh, on a golf scholarship there. Uh, after college, I uh, played professionally for a number of years uh, and about seven years ago started to get into the teaching and coaching side of things. Um, what I realized quickly in, in doing this, I have an you know, emphasis on helping high level junior golfers that are trying to play at the next level was that the same way that you have, you know, a golf swing coach, maybe a mental coach or a physical coach, there needed to be more emphasis put on the college recruiting process because it was getting ever more competitive to try to get these spots. And especially for West Coast people that like to, in general, tend to stay on the West Coast, the competition for these spots was growing uh, immensely and COVID only further complicated that. So this is where I got talking with Joe. Joe and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, Joe used to be in the Monday Night Football truck. So he is a communications expert and presentation specialist. Uh, he actually won an Emmy uh, with his uh, work on the Monday Night Football truck. So pretty cool to have an Emmy winner here as, uh, as part of our crew tonight. Um, so that's a little bit about both myself and Joe. And we're going to kind of dive in here. See, Brad, you're, you're too humble, though. I mean, Brad just skips over the fact that he made the cut at the 2021 PGA Championship, played at Valhalla a few weeks ago. So I will say that for you, Brad, if you're not going to say It was that. on there, Joe. They can read that, you know. <laughs> In any case, um, we mentioned that you all are muted, but we want you to use that chat function. So I want everybody to take just a moment here. If you haven't seen it already, there's a little chat button at the bottom of that Zoom screen. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, you don't have to save them for the end. Please ask questions throughout in that chat. And we really like to engage you all in these conversations. So we're going to ask a few poll questions this evening. So uh, we're just going to ask that you write your responses in that chat as well. All right. And we'll start right there. So this is a, a very basic foundational question here. And it's one that a lot of people struggle with. Um, 
And the answer might be a little controversial, but the first poll question, and remember, write your responses in the chat here. When should I start thinking about college, right? Option A, the first time I swing a club, right? I'm three years old, four years old. I got plastic clubs. I should be thinking about college golf. Option B, freshman year of high school, all right? Option C, sophomore year of high school. Option D, senior year of high school, all right? Oh, great. We're getting a lot of replies already. Uh, I see somebody said eighth grade. Yep. Yeah. Um, and almost exclusively B. All right. I'll give it 30 more seconds for a couple more responses to come in here. But overwhelmingly, people are saying it's it's B for the for the correct answer. When should I start thinking about college and college golf? All right. So I'm going to say B is the consensus here. The answer, at least according to us, is B. So nice job, everybody. Uh, really nice job. Let me clarify, though, and that's why I say this is controversial. There's never a bad time to think about college golf. There's never a bad time. It can be earlier than freshman year. It can be later than freshman year. We think freshman year is ideal because, listen, that's way before your peers who are just students and not student athletes, right? But as a student athlete, this process starts very early. We need to start doing our research early, making sure we are ahead of the curve in, in going and visiting campuses, going and researching programs, who has a golf team, who doesn't, where do I want to go? Because the recruiting process for you is going to start way before you are applying to college as a high school senior. So again, ideal time, freshman year of high school to start thinking about this process. But if you're saying, oh my goodness, I'm a rising junior, I haven't really thought about it till tonight. That's okay too. So when we talk about the recruitment process, what's going into that? If, if, I'm a college coach. How am I making the decision to offer you or not offer you? What components do you need to have as a recruit to be a strong recruit? The first component is, is of course, golf, all right? Now, notice Brad and I didn't say your average score or how many AJGAs you've played, right? Because you're more than just that. So golf, are you showing improvement in your game? Do you have great speed numbers? Did you uh, play very well at a big SCPGA, uh, maybe Toyota Tour Cup event? Whatever it is, where is your golf game? Coaches want to see where you are now and where you could be. That's a big component of what, whether or not they would offer you, of course. But equally important is your academic profile. Think about it. If, if your dream school is UCLA and you have a 2.5 GPA, I don't care what your scores are on the course, you're not going to be able to get into UCLA. So you need to make sure that academically you're sound as well. That's going to give you a lot of options in this process. So academics, just as important as the golf game. The third piece of it, and this is where Brad and I really focus, is let's say you have the same scores as somebody else. Let's say you have the same grades as somebody else. What's going to differentiate you? And what differentiates you is who you are as a recruit, how well you're handling the recruiting process. So Brad and I put together a checklist of some of the key things that you want to do as a recruit as you go through the college golf recruiting process. Awesome. So these, so this you can see is is just a small sample um, and kind of the main points of what we do at Athlos in guiding people through the recruiting process. So this process starts with building a list of schools. And, you know, you might think that, wow, you know, a list would be, you know, 12, 15, 20 schools. But with people that start this process early enough, we're actually building out a list that in, at times is upward of 50 schools. This gives us the ability to have schools on there that are dream schools, kind of reach schools, some safety schools, and then a very large portion of them that seem like very realistic options for us. After we go through that process of, of building that list, we're going to turn to writing strong emails to coaches. This is always how the process starts is introducing yourself via email. Um, for, for various reasons, you know, we, we can't just call the coach right away. Um, there's some recruiting rules and things like that that become a little trickier that we can get into at a later point. But the basis of the start of this communication is going to be you writing an email and these coaches are getting tons and tons of emails. You know, some coaches will get 50, 60 emails a day. So how do we make your email stand out? It's got to be succinct. It's got to stand out. And then after we get some emails in, eventually we're going to move to talking to coaches on the phone, texting with coaches. How are we going to handle that communication? 
Because that communication, when you're 16, 17 years old, and you're talking to somebody who might be you know, three times your age at your dream school can be a very intimidating thing. So how are we going to handle that? And we'll walk you through, you know, things that we're looking for and tips that are going to help you navigate that situation. The other thing we'll talk about is scheduling appropriate tournaments. So depending on, you know, your list of schools, there's going to be, you know, the right kind of tournaments you're looking for. If we're just looking for really local Division three schools, you know, we probably don't need to travel across the country playing AJGA events, spending a ton of money. But if we're looking to go to the best of the best, if we're looking to go to USC, UCLA, Arizona State, Oklahoma State, we've got to be challenging ourselves against the best competition there is. So making sure that those tournaments fit your goals is really important. You all are very lucky because you guys have so many good tournaments within driving distance of your house with the SCPGA. So make sure you're taking advantage of those. Uh, there's nothing better in state than you know top level competition at that at Toyota Tour Cup. So, you know, keep taking advantage of those opportunities close to home. Those are by far the best place to start. And even if you get really really good, those tournaments are still outstanding events to play in. Brad, can I jump in real quick here? Yeah. So so we talked about this on our last webinar with the SCPGA Junior Tour, and we're seeing some familiar names and faces. So um, welcome back. So you all will remember this, but um, one piece of tournament advice is that you want to try to play two-day events, multi-day events. There's a lot of people that reach out to us, good golfers, but they've only played one-day events in the past. We won't spend a ton of time on this this evening, I promise, but in order to be on Junior Golf Scoreboard, which is sort of a ranking system of the junior golfers in the country, something that college coaches look at, in order to be on there, you need to play multiple multi-day events every year. And so just make sure that one-day events are great, fantastic, but make sure that we're also playing multiple multi-day events every year as well. That's one tournament hack that everybody should know. Awesome. Great addition there, Joe. Um, so moving on on this list, uh, after we're, after we're doing this, we've started communication with coaches. We're going to want to shoot swing videos because coaches are going to be interested not just in what your scores are, but what your swing looks like, what your short game looks like. Um, this is not uncommon for you know coaches to ask for swing videos in this recruiting process, but we also want to be proactive and shoot these before coaches start asking for them. You can maybe post these on Instagram, things like that, so coaches can see your progress over time. And touching on Instagram, this is something to discuss with your family, but Instagram social media is becoming an increasingly important part of the recruiting process. Uh, a lot of college coaches will follow junior golfers there, keep tabs on them through their Instagram account. Um, just a little quick tip on that is make that a golf specific account. Don't mix golf with, with personal stuff. So just create a separate account if you're going to do Instagram uh, for, your, for your junior golf. And then finally, and this, this should start earlier than you think, take campus visits. If you're playing in a, in a city that has a college, you know, if you have a morning tea time, go walk around for a half hour in the afternoon. If you're driving through somewhere on a family vacation, go see a school that you might have interest in. Even if you're not super, super interested in it, it's still going to give you a perspective of what that campus is like, and you can compare it to other campuses. Learn if you like schools that are in an urban environment, if you like schools that are a little bit smaller versus bigger. There's so many different options out there. The key is to find the one that's right for you. Right. And that's one of the reasons we say, hey, ideally, you start thinking about this as a freshman, because if you start thinking about this as a freshman, You'll take the time to stop by campuses, not even meet with coaches, right? It's too early to meet with coaches at that stage. But stop by campuses, as Brad said, see what you like, see what you don't like. Um, Brad, before we move on here, there's a, a question in the chat, direct message to me. Um, is IMG event as good as the two-day tournament? Um, are, they, are they talking about the IMG qualifier, Joe, you think, or... Yeah, my question, and, and Diana, feel free to um, clarify, but my, my guess is that you're talking about the IMG one-day qualifiers, which, which are great. I mean, they're very competitive fields, and if you make it through, you can play in the IMG Junior Worlds, which is a fantastic multi-day event. So, you know, just to clarify, what we're saying by playing multiple-day tournaments is not stop playing one-day events. One-day events, especially if they're qualifiers, 
for the Nota Begay or IMG or some of the amateur type tournaments. Those are great. Play those. That's fine. But make sure that we're playing multiple multi-day events every year as well. Great. Okay, we'll keep rolling here, Brad. And as always, keep using that chat function to ask any questions you would like. That's a great question to start us off. Okay, another poll question for you all. So again, we'd love for you to write in the chat as you did before with your guesses here. All right, so we are just a few days away from June 15th. And when I say June 15th, several of you are thinking, hey, I've heard about June 15th. I know that that means something in the recruiting calendar. But what it means, not, not everybody's sure, okay? So the question is, what happens on June 15th? Option A, after my sophomore year, so June 15th after my sophomore year, so that's students in the class of 2026, coaches will reach out to me. Option B, on June 15th, just D1 and D2 coaches will reach out to me, All right? The D1 and D2 coaches are allowed to have substantive communication with me. And D, I'm allowed to send emails on June 15th. So what is correct? What actually happens on June 15th? Uh, we're seeing some C's so far. Anybody else have guesses here? Okay. D thrown in there. Great. D, great. This is awesome. Yeah. Okay, it looks like largely C here. So we're gonna say the group is gonna say C, Brad. C is correct. So let's talk about June 15th for a moment because I literally just had somebody email me yesterday saying, uh, hey, we're coming up on June 15th and my son is gonna start hearing from college coaches on June 15th. Not necessarily, all right? What's really important to note is on June 15th, D1 and D2 coaches are allowed to have substantive communication with you. Prior to then, they could respond to emails you sent and said, hey, they'd say something like, hey, NCAA rules don't permit us to have serious contact with you until June 15th, all right? That does not mean that they're gonna just out of the blue reach out to you on June 15th. The way to get good communication on June 15th, give yourself the best shot, is to send really good and multiple emails prior to June 15th. I promise you, if you have not sent emails and you're sitting there and you wake up on the morning of June 15th, you're not going to have emails from college coaches. They're too busy to scour the country, finding the best golfers, finding their email addresses. So make sure you are being proactive. If you're doing this the right way, yes, on June 15th, coaches will respond to you. But just because they're allowed to doesn't mean they're going to. So speaking of what happens this summer, and again, if you have questions about June 15th, write it in the chat. Speaking about what happens this summer, why is the summer so important? So we just sent out an email about this through SCPGA Junior Tour, but we think that the summer is the most important part of the college golf calendar. Why? Again, write your responses in here. Option A, I have more time to practice and play tournaments. B, I have more time to spend on recruiting. C, coaches aren't in their season, so they have more time to spend on recruiting. D, all of the above. Okay. I'm not, I'm not fooling most of you here. I think, I think they're on to us, Brad. <laughs> okay, so, so as, as the responses continue to come in, yes, it's D, all of the above, right? More time to practice and play, more time to spend on recruiting for you, and coaches aren't in their season. Yeah, so this, expanding on this a little bit, um, College golf is a very unique sport in that the the calendar is split into two parts. So they have a, kind of a sprint of a fall season. So from when so from when college starts, you know, end of August, early September for a lot of schools through about the end of October, that's the whole fall season. Uh, and they're going to pack four or five events into that small period of time. So during those eight weeks, coaches are not super into recruiting. They're trying to get their teams off to a nice start to the season. They're trying to get you know their freshman players adjusted to life on campus. Fall can be a pretty chaotic time. And then there's a small period of time, kind of you know middle of November through early February, where yes, they're a little bit slower, but there's not a ton of tournaments going on. So you don't have a ton to be communicating with them about. Um, there is recruiting that goes on there. And then once spring season starts in February, it's seven, eight, nine events in a 11, 12 week period. 
So to think that they're going to be doing any kind of substantial recruiting in that time period is, is just not usually the case. So you have this window of time and, you know, the friends that I'm college coaches that I'm friends with, um, you know, they, they talk about how they are really just playing catch up after they're done with either their conference tournament regionals or nationals, depending on where their season ends. And so some coaches, you know, just got done a couple of weeks ago. And so they're going to have the next two and a half months to really focus on recruiting. And this is where it's really important on your end to essentially start recruiting the coaches because unless we're a top 50 player, unless we're, we're dominating junior golf in your local area and having some, some success on a national level, your phone is not going to be blowing up on June 15th. We can, we can promise you that, you know, we hope it is, but we have to prepare and do everything we can in the recruiting process to take matters into our own hands and get these college coaches interested in us. And this summer is the, the summer is the easiest time to do this because we all know how swamped you get with school uh, in the school year. It's easier on your end as well. You have more time to devote to this process over the summer. Brad, before you move on here, uh, another question in the chat. What year is the best time to start to write emails to coaches and how do you find their emails? So emails, emails are easy easy ish. Um, if you go to, uh, if you go to a website of, you know, the, the golf program of a specific school, the coach's email should be listed on, um, on that website under, you know, probably under roster, um, or, or contact info. Um, and then in terms of, in terms of when to start emailing, um, late freshman year, Late freshman year would be a good time. Early sophomore year would would give you probably the best the best opportunity. Um, you know, if you have super super high aspirations, you're maybe starting in the earlier side of freshman year. Um, but typically, not a whole lot of benefit to starting like in seventh or eighth grade. Right. We always say ideally it's the summer before your sophomore year that you start sending emails. But again, we're, we're saying ideally here. I'm sure there are people that, you know, are in the class of 2025, 2026. You have not sent emails yet. That's okay. That's okay. But understand that we might be a little bit behind if that's where we are. So let's start sending emails, right? The, the only way to catch up is to send emails. Great question. Thank you. Brad? Yeah, so here's a few more keys to success um, that we talk about a lot with the people that we work with. I touched on this in the last slide, but if you can kind of take the idea that like a coach is going to recruit you and flip that around, you're going to have a lot of success with this process. So you really need to go out and recruit these coaches. If we think of it from like the biggest sport, right, the sport that makes the most money, Right, that would be football. These football teams have, you know, eight, 10, sometimes more people doing scouting for, for these big teams like in the, in the SEC or like Stanford football. That doesn't happen with golf. You know, even at the really large successful programs, it might just be a head coach and an assistant and maybe one volunteer assistant. So you have to be proactive. You have to be the one going after the coach to let the coach know what you're up to, how your scores have been. If your scores haven't been great, you know, you still need to update them, but tell them what you're working on and why you've struggled your last couple of tournaments. Um, another thing is, is definitely be open minded, um, cast a much wider net early on, you know, maybe some schools that you don't think you'd, you'd definitely be interested in, put them on the list. We can always take them off the list later, but it's a lot harder to add schools later in the process. And it's not a ton more work to be reaching out to, say, 50 schools as opposed to 30. And then just keep working hard. We, gotta, we have to work hard in the classroom. Uh, good grades are going to open up a lot more doors in terms of what schools uh, you're, are going to be an option for you. And understand that good grades will also likely land you some sort of academic money uh, because there's just not a lot of scholarships to go around. Um, it's very, very rare for, for someone to get a full scholarship uh, for golf because on the men's side, division one and two, there's only four and a half 
scholarships per team if that university is fully funded. Obviously, keep working hard on your golf. Your scores are very important. But then, you know, the same way that I'm sure like many of you are, are working hard in the gym, we've got to work hard on recruiting. Because if we don't work hard on the recruiting, there's going to be other people that shoot similar-ish scores to us that pass us by in that recruiting process because they're going about that recruiting process the right way. And finally, college golf is possible. You know, if you're if you're open to a wide variety of schools, you know, if, if you want to play college golf, it can happen. Um, and you know, we've seen this this time and time again. You know, the people that land at uh, some of these schools that you know, might not be the, you know, ones you see on TV every weekend and, you know, basketball or football, but, you know, people that go through this process the right way end up with a lot of options at the end and more often than not are very, very happy with their, with their decision and their, their time at, at, in college. Speaking of which, these are our commitments that we worked with in the 2023, 2024, and they're just starting to commit in the 2025 class. So why, why are we showing you this slide? A couple of reasons. One is look at the variety in schools here. You've got Ivy League schools, but there's also a Merchant Marine Academy on here. So completely different types of education. There's D1, D2, D3, NAIA. There's Southern California, Northern California, non-California. I mean, it's all over the place. And it's because all of these students said, my goal is to find the best fit for me. Not everybody said, hey, the only place I want to play is Stanford. And if I don't go to Stanford, I don't go anywhere. No, they found the best fit for them. And if you approach this process the right way, ideally, you don't just get left with one option for college golf, where you say, I have to play there. It's the only place that's interested in me, even though I don't like it. No, you have multiple options and you pick what the best fit for you is. So that's the first thing is the variety of different schools on here is really what you should have is if as a student, you're finding the best fit for you. The second thing is, and Brad just touched on it, every single one of these students worked at this process, right? As we've said before, think about it like this. Coaches aren't going to recruit you. You are going to recruit coaches. And that's kind of a bummer in some ways. But the good news is if we understand that, we're going to be out working everybody else because we're the ones understanding, hey, we got to send emails. Coach is not going to email me. I got to reach out to them. And so I'd say if you spend about an average of 45 minutes to an hour per week on recruiting, you're going to be in a very good spot. I'm not saying four hours a week, right? This isn't like school, nothing insane. But I'm also not saying five minutes a week. So if you can devote 45 minutes to an hour per week to work on recruiting, to work on finding schools, work on emailing coaches, work on updating coaches, you're going to have a shot, a real shot, like Brad said, to play college golf. Sorry. And just to echo what Joe said, if the later you start in this process, it's going to be more than 45 minutes or an hour a week. And then it's right. not going to be nearly as enjoyable. If we wait until very late in junior year or summer after junior year to start this process, you're going to have to play catch up with people that have been doing this for 18 months, for 12 months. Um, and it, it's at that point where you're also probably playing more higher level junior golf your classes in high school are getting more and more rigorous so we have less and less time if we start early this process can be paced very well and it will not feel very overwhelming because you're just like joe said 45 minutes an hour a week and you just kind of chip away at it um, over a couple of years right so we're getting some questions in the chat now so this is a great place to pause before we wrap up here so again, we're, we're partners with the SCPGA Junior Tour. So our, our main goal here is to help you all out through this process. Um, so if you have any questions at all about something we covered, about something we didn't cover, um, you know, please feel free to write it in the chat. Okay, are there any specific things that I should mention or talk about in my emails to coaches, Brad? Um, I mean, that's all, you know, very kind of case by case dependent, uh, but we want to start, especially in the intro emails, like it's not always going to look the same because you want something that's going to be eye catching to a coach. So like Joe mentioned earlier, if you're a very high speed player, right, we might want to put our club head speed in that intro email. 
if you've just played a recent tournament and say just shot, you know, something under par or, you know, a personal best, we want to talk about that. So it just depends on, you know, it depends on the individual what needs to go in there. But it, again, that intro email needs to be succinct. It needs to be short. You know, a lot of coaches are excited if you're multi-sport athlete, if you come from, you know, a different sport background, you know, that, that athleticism tends to, to transfer over to golf. So there's not anything that I would say, like, must be in there about you yourself, other than like something like GPA and upcoming tournaments. And then, you know, what you've done, what you've done recent, recently, some recent highlights. Thanks, Brad. Okay, a couple more good questions here. Um, we had one parent, by the way, recommend um, the resume, adding your resume to junior golf scoreboard. You know, our take, frankly, is that if you only have so much time to spend, we'd rather that time be spent on Instagram. But certainly we're big fans of JGS. Uh, Mac Thayer is a friend of ours who runs JGS. Um, so not a, not a bad thing to do, but it wouldn't be the top of our priority list. Um, you guys work with international students who are outside of the USA. Um, that's a great question. Uh, why don't you email me on the side and we can discuss that. Um, what are schools looking for regarding the ratio between GPA and golf rankings? So that, that balance, Brad, what's kind of more important GPA or how you're playing at a junior level? Uh, depends on the, depends on the school. Um, you know, the more prestigious academic institution, you know, they're not really going to be able to bend usually very much on the GPA. So what I would say is that, you know, having a high GPA is only going to help us. It's going to help us, you know, get admission into tougher schools. It's going to help us, uh, it's going to help us potentially earn more academic scholarship money. It's going to make, you know, yourself look better in the eye of these, of the coach, just because when you're on these college rosters, the team GPA matters a lot to that coach and how that coach is kind of graded by the athletic department. So if he knows that he's got a 4.0 student coming in that he's not going to have to worry about at all academically, it's going to help boost his team's GPA. It's going to look very favorably on you as a recruit. Right. Uh Athlos first NCSA. That was a, that's a great question. So I think the easiest way to describe this is that we're sort of completely different services. So NCSA is a, a huge national organization um, that works with thousands of students um, all over the country and perhaps internationally as well. They're not golf specific. Um, they are uh, any sport you can sign up for. Um, we frankly have worked with many people who came to us from NCSA <laughs> that are on this, this slide here. Uh, because what it is, it's, it's sort of just a, a one size fits all. I think there probably are good features of that site, um, but it's a lot of sales as well. Hey, come to this camp, hey, sign up for this. Um, our approach is very different. So there's two Athlos employees and you're looking at them. <laughs> we are based in California. We only work with golfers. So what we do is much more specialized. It's completely specific to golf. And we spend an incredible amount of personal one-on-one -on -one time with each student, uh, which is something that NCSA doesn't do. I'm not trying to denigrate them. I'm just, they're completely different services, um, even though they both purport to, to help with the recruiting process. Obviously, we, uh, we're biased and we, we think that Athlos is a better uh, service, but you, know, you can take that for what it's worth. Yeah, uh, I, the, the comparison that I would probably make is more like trying to learn golf from a golf instructor in person or trying to learn golf from like an app on your phone. Um, possible to get better, you know, watching YouTube, watching Instagram, you know, downloading some golf app, but probably going to have a lot better success working with a coach one-on-one -on -one, um, that's able to tailor that lesson to your specific needs as a golfer. So a lot of these questions, Brad, are coming in by a direct message. Uh, so I'll just read them. Um, how do you maintain an Instagram account? Um, probably less work on the Instagram account than you would think. Uh, it doesn't need to be overwhelming. It doesn't need to be weekly posts. Um, you know, if you have a successful tournament and want to make a post about it, go for it. Don't think there's a need to post every single every single event. If you're playing 20 events over the course of the year. Um, it's a good place. Instagram is a good place to, to keep updated swing videos. Um, 
So every every few months, you can shoot swing videos and post them there, just so coaches can kind of see the progress of where where your swing started and where your swing is headed. Um, so you can you can use it. You know, there are people that use it a lot, but I think that just having you know just some baseline info on there, um, update it. You know, a couple times a month would be would be great. But even if it's only once a month, you're still doing still doing good work there. For women's golf, are the scholarships full or split up? Uh, split up. So they have, uh, so they have six scholarships to use at a division one level. Um, but now understand that just because they have six scholarships to use, they can break those up into partial scholarships. It's not a binary, um, it's not a binary all or nothing, but just because they have the ability to give out six scholarships does not mean that every university is going to be fully funded and have the money to give out six scholarships they're permitted by by rule to give out six scholarships but that does not mean that they have to give out six scholarships right there's it, it's it's a little rare especially on the boys side that a coach will give a full ride a full scholarship so what they want to do to help you out the most is they want you to be a great student because that means you can get an academic scholarship so especially several of the boys players on here they went to school for free but it's because they were able to get some athletic scholarship plus a sizable academic scholarship, which made it free or close to free overall, which is yet another reason why we say it's really important to do well in school. You're helping yourself so much by doing well in school. Uh, but certainly, like Brad said, we cannot expect to get a full ride or a full scholarship, especially athletically at any level. It's great if it happens, but we can't expect it. Brad, which multi-day tournaments are the most effective? Um, I mean, stick, stick close to home early on. Uh, there's just no, you know, there's just, just no reason to play, you know, much outside of, of SCPGA stuff. So obviously trying to work your way up to Toyota tour cup would be great, but even, um, you know, even if it's just a two day event, you know, run by the SCPGA that isn't Toyota tour cup you're still doing great there. Um, there's some other, some other stuff in the state of California, like hurricane tour FCG, but, um, there's so many SCPGA events that I would just honestly just stick with, stick with those. Right. And you all are familiar with how that works. Basically they've set up this great program, this pathway to, to progress through SCPGA junior tour events. So wherever you are in your journey, in your game, there's something for you with the SCPGA. So again, you're so lucky to have such a great organization in your backyard. Brad and I talked to students from Montana that are driving three hours on average for their closest event. So, you know, just, just stay local first. Um, next question here, referring to two day tournaments, if I post a good score, like two or three under, then a four or five over the next day, is it worth including or informing a coach about that tournament? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think that, you know, junior golfers in general tend to fall into this trap that that they're supposed to be this finished product when they're 14, 15, 16 years old. Um, you know, if no one expects you to be this this polished product, I mean, talk about, you know, what what went well when you shot three under and then talk about what didn't go well when you shot four or five over and what you're going to do in practice, what you're going to work on with your coach. Uh, when, you know, to get better, to make that not happen. Um, you know, that's how you can really set yourself apart as a recruit. It's really easy to email when you shoot 67, 67, <laughs> but set yourself apart, you know, after a bad one and just be like, Hey, like, this is where I struggled. I struggled, you know, I struggled off the tee. I was kind of getting sloppy with my routine and, and my aim. And I've worked on that with my coach and I'm excited to get back out there in two weeks um, and give it another go. I just worked with one of our students today a few hours ago who just shot 78, 80 in a tournament. And we worked together to, to write emails to send to coaches. You have to update coaches. They know, like Brad said, you're not a finished product. Tell them you understand your game, you understand your flaws, and you're working toward that end goal. So absolutely. Um, are college exposure golf camps worth the money? I'll answer this real quick. You know, I, I want you to have a strategy uh, when you're going to those camps. Understand that the primary purpose of those camps is not for coaches to find their next batch of recruits. Could it happen? Sure. But that's not the primary intent of those camps. So make sure you, you're going to that camp for a specific reason. Is it because 
um, you've never met a college coach before and this camp was right down the road and it would be really fun to see what life would be like as a as a UCLA golfer. Sure, go. I mean, I've heard they're fun. Or, you know, have you been really trying to meet a coach in person that hasn't worked, hasn't worked, and they're coming to Southern California to do a camp and you can go. Sure, go. But make sure there's a strategy. Don't just go and say, hey, I'm going to go and play amazing golf for the two-day camp and I'm going to get five offers from coaches. That's almost certainly not going to happen. So we don't, we're not anti-camp at all. Just make sure there's a purpose behind your, your participation. Um, the second question uh, as part of that, Brad, was, um, and I'll let you take this one. What is your experience working with D3 programs for merit scholarships, so academic merit scholarships, or even NAIA? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly like the coaches know that obviously at Division Three they don't have athletic scholarship to offer, right? So these coaches are not ignorant to that fact. So they are well aware that they need to more than likely come up with ways to help ease the burden of the cost of those schools. But this goes back to what Joe and I have harped on all evening is the only way that you're going to give yourself the best shot to earn that is by getting good grades. Um, so just, just staying on top of that. And this is, you know, these coaches understand that this is part of you know, a lot of people's ability to come to those schools is they're going to need to get some academic aid. So they'll, they'll certainly know what you need to do and what, what GPA you need to um, have to qualify for some of those. Right. And I'll ask the next question here because it kind of ties in for college academic scholarship. Will it be the applicant's own responsibility to apply or will the golf coach help in that aspect? Typically, as Brad was saying, what happens is the golf coach knows your academic information they'll get your transcript from you and they'll give it to the admissions department and if the coach is really trying to recruit you the admissions department may inform the coach hey so and so is going to be eligible and probably going to get a twenty five thousand dollar a year academic scholarship if they come here so then the coach can communicate that to you hey not only am i giving you an athletic scholarship or i can't give you an athletic scholarship but the admissions department said you're going to get 25k a year if you come here so there is some coach facilitation. That being said, you know, you can and should still apply for scholarships on your own, independent of the school. There's so many third party scholarships out there. It's free money sitting out there waiting for you to apply for it when you're applying to school. So that's all on you. The coach has nothing to do with that type of scholarship. Great question so far. We'll give it another few minutes here before we move on. Any questions, you know, I'll, I'll point toward the 2026ers on this, this Zoom for a moment here. So rising juniors. So any questions about, you know, June 15th or what you can expect this summer because you are allowed to have that real communication with coaches at the D1 and D2 level for the first time this summer. Um, this is certainly an important one. We don't expect anybody in your class to commit this summer necessarily. A few do, but by and large, it doesn't happen. But it's certainly a huge summer from a recruiting standpoint, because really, you know, you only have two big recruiting summers, right? It's the summer before your junior year, the summer before your senior year. Uh, the summer before your junior year is, is really where you're forming those relationships. The summer before your senior year is often when you get offered. Um, so especially for any parents or juniors in the 2026 class rising juniors in high school, let us know if you have any questions. I'm happy to address those as well. Okay, what happens in case of an injury? I've read that scholarships are on a renewal basis. What happens if a player wants to take a year off and focus on academics solely? And this is while this is while in college, Joe. We, See, it seems like yeah. while in college, yes. Uh, I mean, taking a year off a team just to focus on academics and not be a part of the team is almost unheard of. Um, if you're going into college with the idea that that golf is going to help pull you into this college and you're going to get a scholarship for this, but then you're not going to give it 100 percent once you're on that golf team, uh, that that's not a good plan because um, you're likely going to lose. You're likely going to lose some scholarship money. And honestly, you you probably deserve to lose some scholarship money because this is, you know, there's people people out there that 
you know, would be dying for that spot on that team. We've seen it before where people show up at a university and then put in zero effort for those four years. Um, so yeah, if you don't, you know, you, you've got to be willing to perform and put in and put in the work because scholarship can be taken away. Right. Um, occasionally at the D3 level, uh, lower D3 level, somebody will take a semester off to go study abroad or something like that. But yeah, I mean, we're going through this process because you want to play college golf for four years. Uh, for the injury component, yeah, most co coaches are going to understand you couldn't prevent that injury. So they're going to honor your spot. They're going to honor your scholarship, whatever it is in college. Technically, they don't have to, but um, by and large, they do. Um, Another good question. Are there any resources you would recommend to get detailed information for college golf programs other than the college's website? Brad, I'll, I'll just recommend, um, you know, I'll say that far and away, the, the best source is that college's website. And we're not just talking about the college team page, right? If you click on, you know, athletics, women's golf, men's golf, whatever, not just the team page, but the university's page itself. Right. you got to find a school that's not just an athletic fit, but that's an academic fit for you. So check out the university's page. See what that school specializes in. Um, also, there's, you know, rankings like clipped rankings is is the primary service right now. You could also look at U.S. News and World Report to get more athletic information. Uh, but, yeah, the, the school's page, whether it's their their golf page or the university's homepage, are, are the best sources of information. Um, certainly what we use. Um Brad, how often should I be emailing coaches about my progress and tournament scores? Once a month would be a nice rough goal. I would say as like the summer is a little busier. If you're if you're playing a bunch of tournaments, I'd try to get something out every, you know, every two to three weeks. And then in the wintertime, if it's a little slow and you're not playing in much, I wouldn't let it go much more than five or six weeks. Even if you're not, even if you're not playing in any tournaments, I mean, let them know what you're doing. You know, you're working on your swing. Are you getting in the gym, trying to add, trying to add speed and athleticism? Are you focusing on, on academics? Um, just keep them updated. And those updates don't have to be very long. So I really, you'd really have to have a, a pretty extenuating circumstance to go more than four or five weeks without sending a coach an update. Brad, does high school golf matter? For sure. For sure. Um, you know, especially if your if your high school has a team. If your high school doesn't have a team, you know, the coach isn't going to hold that against you. But if you're, you know, if you're actively skipping out on a high school that has a team, I mean, I, I could see how a coach would would not look very fondly of that because at the end of the day, when you step on campus, you're going to have to be part of a team for four or five years and your ability to do that in high school uh, and whether it's whether it's high school golf or another sport in high school just proves to that coach that you can you know, survive and thrive in a team environment. People that you know have not been part of a team and then all of a sudden we get thrust into this team environment freshman year of college that can be you know, that can be difficult. So it's not just to, to show the coach, it's also for yourself so that you're better prepared for what to expect uh, when you step foot on campus. Wonderful. All right, so we'll, we'll start to wrap up here, but that doesn't mean that you should stop asking questions. You can ask questions till we sign off of the Zoom here. All right, so anything else that comes up, feel free to write it in the chat. Um, but we wanted to let you know that We'd love to help you through this process. As we said, and as Nikki said at the beginning, we partner with the SCPGA Junior Tour with the intent of helping Southern California junior golfers through the college recruitment process. So if you're thinking to yourself, hey, you know, I really want to go after this. I'm a, I'm a rising freshman, I'm a rising sophomore, I'm a rising junior. It's time for me to really take charge of this process. We'd love to help you with that. So you just email me, athlosjoe, A-T-H-L-O-S-J-O-E at gmail.com. We'll have a conversation. We'll figure out where you are. We'll set up a plan. Then you'll decide if this is a, re a good fit for you. Uh, our goal, as Brad said earlier, we lead you from A to Z. Wherever you are on the recruiting process, if that's nowhere, through the entire recruiting process until you get an offer, until you commit. All right. So we'd love to help you with that. Um, we are going to be at Beaumont. As uh, Nikki said earlier, we're going to be at Oak Valley uh, on Tuesday after the first round of Q School. So whether you're playing in that event 
and you stop by after your round or you're in the Beaumont area, please come by, at least say hi, ask whatever you want. Uh, we're going to be doing presentations um, at Oak Valley in that afternoon. So we'd love to see you stop by, say hi. Saw you guys in the webinar, wanted to say hi in person. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, before we sign off though, Brad, we're getting um, some more questions. Can you provide more info on your service and fee arrangement? Um, I'll reach out to you directly to sort of talk about all those details. Um, and then another question, will the recording be sent out to us? So this recording is going to live in two different places. This recording will live on the athleticscollegecoaching.com website. Um, it's also going to be on the College Golf Pathway page on the SCPGA Junior Tour. So if you look under member resources, there's a page just with college golf information from us. It'll have this webinar. It'll also have other recordings and some other good videos that can help you through the process. So yes, please, uh, please know that this is going to be available to you uh, forever as a resource. Okay. Um, in a first email to a college coach, what should you include in it? Um, Brad tackled a little bit of this earlier, but you know, just briefly here, obviously give the basic information, who you are, where you are, that kind of thing. If you're a great student, you want to put that in. If there's anything unique or special about you, maybe you've got a great swing speed, maybe you had a great tournament six months ago you want to talk about, put that in there as well. Also include what you're working on in practice and include what your upcoming tournaments are. And that's a really good start for schools. Good question. Very good question. Okay, any other questions here before we wrap up? Okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you all so much uh, for joining this evening. We really hope that you found this helpful. Uh, we look forward to doing more webinars in the future. Again, any questions at all that you have, please feel uh, free to reach out to me directly, athlosjoe at gmail.com. We'd be happy to help you.